Up next is my interview with Tammy Stronach, an actress, dancer, and choreographer best known for her role as the childlike empress in The NeverEnding Story. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Hi, I'm your host, Jackie Borowski, and I am here with Tammy Stronach. Tammy, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. How are you, Jackie? I'm excellent. Thank you for calling into our show. My um, pleasure. Uh, so I'm going to ask you first about your experience as the childlike empress. I am a huge fan of The NeverEnding Story. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things about you was not just the role itself. Like for little girls, we loved that role, obviously. But um, one of the things I loved was the headpiece. And when I was a little girl, I would wear necklaces on my head because I was so fascinated by um, by that choice that the costumer or jeweler or whoever does that made. Um, yeah. How did you feel about that costume? Oh, no, I, I love the headpiece. I think it was definitely sort of one of the distinguishing features and I really think costuming is really essential to getting into character. I think it's you know very very important. It's funny because one of the dancers that I've been working with for the last couple of years, a beautiful dancer in New York, finally after two years of working intensely you know in my company and in all these different pieces said you know I really just have to tell you that I spent most of my youth with that pearl thing on my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> It's not just me. So it was a funny moment. <laughs> it, it was setting up fashion, fa a fashion icon for the 80s. Um, and my second question is, uh, I know that the movie was produced in Germany, but you were originally from San Francisco. Was that your first time in Germany? And what was it like for you to, to travel that far to do? I guess it was your first movie, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I grew up a little bit bouncing around the globe uh, in the sense that I was born in Iran. My parents were working there as archaeologists and um, my mother is Israeli and after the revolution we spent some time in Israel and then after that we spent some time in England before settling in, in the US. So um, in some ways I was rather prepared to sort of be told pack your things and put them in a suitcase we're going to a foreign country. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so, you know, and luckily I really loved traveling. It was something that I really enjoyed and I was really excited about seeing a new country and hearing a new language and um, I've, and eating new foods and all of that. So um, it was, you know, it was great. Um, I heard also in a different interview that you did um, that you you visited other sets because you were just in that one kind of like seashell -y set. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> did you did you have a favorite set that you got to visit other than your own? I I mean I loved visiting the rock where the rock biter was with oh, the yeah. bat and that whole little group of of characters. It was just um, seeing all the people pulling the levers on the side and the amount of teamwork that was involved in just getting each thing to move properly was really um, beautiful. I mean, it's sort of sad in a way, like the, obviously seeing the film is incredible, but when you see the amount of people kind of all working together to make this one object move, <laughs> there's something really beautiful about that. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed watching the behind the scenes. So did you have did you have a favorite aspect about about playing that role? Um, yeah, I think, you know, for for me, I got lucky in a way in the sense that, you know, sometimes you play a role that it's a it, you don't necessarily love the character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you sometimes play the bad guy, you play yeah. all kinds of things. So um, but th there was something about um, being given the opportunity to, um, as a little girl, play a character that was so strong um, and having her strength not come from brawn, but come from her ability to be compassionate and from her wisdom and from her patience, which, you know, I think we don't often define strength in those terms so it was a, it was um it was just a very rich 
character. And I think little girls are so often aster, uh, underestimated and kind of relegated to the land of cute. And and this character had a kind of gravitas to her, even though she was so frail and so young, that that I thought was really exciting to show that, you know, little little girls through just being really wise and compassionate um, could be really uh, powerful. I agree with you so much. I mean, that's how I felt when I was a little girl watching it. I, I felt like here, because when you're a little girl, you don't necessarily think, okay, it's realistic for me to be a superhero. Not that it's realistic for me to be a princess either, but, um, I think it entirely is, <laughs> Yeah, but it's more, it's more, you can envi- I I felt like for me, at least I could envision myself like making certain decisions in that position rather than I could envision, it was easier for me than to envision myself as like Wonder Woman or something. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I feel like in inside of all these sort of discussions of different characters and different role models, you know, it can get really tricky. Like one certainly wouldn't ever want to limit the field to fewer role models or characters. And the whole point of art is that it should allow for vast stretches of imagination. Certainly that's the point of the never ending story. Oh yes. yes. But but I do think it's interesting if, you know, especially for female characters, that so many of the stories we tell, the 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 ways in which they're strong or valiant or brave tend to kind of mimic characteristics we often assign to male characters. And and certainly like, you know, Sigourney Weaver and Alien is just so awesome and it's strong and you know, like you're like, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love that. I love showing those kinds of women. So that's but I also think there's something unique and intriguing about redefining what courage and strength is and to kind of turn things on their head and 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 present those as ideals that we might assign to more feminine characters. Yes, that is so true. I'm actually, I'm going to go back to, um, because I know you're a dancer and a choreographer, and you also, you work with puppetry. Is that what the Paper Canoe Company is, your um, your theater company? Yes. Paper Canoe Company was a whimsical attempt to bring everything I am passionate about under one umbrella. And for many years, they I felt like all these different pieces that I was interested in were kind of floating in different areas. And, you know, what what is what does acting have to do with dancing, having to do with puppetry, having to do with singing? It was sort of, and I, I did all kinds of projects and I would slip between different mediums and, um, and Paper Canoe formed with the birth of my daughter. And it just suddenly occurred to me that I started in family entertainment. <laughs> and that's where the never ending story, you know, I began there. And um, and it just felt really timely with the birth of my daughter to shift my attention to a new format and um, bring uh, movement and object manipulation and puppetry and theater and song um, together in one forum uh, to to kind of you know uh, tell stories for people aged two to one hundred and two. <laughs> I love that. Um, one of the things that I saw because I I looked up your company online and one of the pictures that I loved was. Um, you have these these pictures of of people with the puppets and um you were talking earlier about how in the never ending story it took so much effort to do manipulation with the puppets did you have and i know um we're having like a huge nostalgia for the 80s right now with stranger things and dark crystal um did you have like an early draw to to that kind of medium exploring puppetry well, it's funny, you know, in some ways I think you get attracted to things and you don't always connect the dots in your own life. And then yeah. later it sort of, it all seems to kind of come together, but that's not how it feels <laughs> at the time. Um, I think that uh, dancing was really good preparation for puppetry. And um, part of that is just the physical precision of dance. Um lends itself to the physical precision of puppetry. And also in dance, unlike acting, you're always asking yourself how you can express something through the body. Well, how do the mm-hmm. feet move to convey tension or nervousness? And how do they move to convey happiness? And so um, 
kind of waking up and 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 expressing uh, emotion through body parts is just so translatable to puppetry. Um, so I feel like you know, starting in theater and then moving through dance, it was all just sort of a natural progression into the kinds of skills that um, make puppetry interesting. I love that you've blended all these different types of art forms because it sounds like you have just a very wide range of interests in different types of art, which is really, really fun and exciting. Um, what inspires you? What what kind of things do you see in the world that you say, hmm, I want, I want my art to speak about this? Well, it's an interesting thing. I, I'll go back to what I said before about not, not narrowing the scope to any any one kind of doctrine, I think, you know, there's room for everybody. And that's what's so wonderful about art. I'm, I'm very attracted to political art. I mean, you know, I'm dying to go see the 1984 play that's in New York now that's getting all those crazy reviews. And um, But I also think that there's art that that isn't political at all. Um, and, and, and yet somehow the meaning that an audience pours into it, um, that artwork comes to life in a way the artist might never have imagined. And I think it's interesting because Michael Ende, who wrote The Neverending Story, was considered, uh, by all accounts that I read, I have as much information as other people. I certainly didn't didn't know him. Mm -hmm. um, he was considered rather lightweight because he was making this escapist art uh, where you run away to fantasy and it wasn't um, it didn't have you know sort of wasn't political it wasn't serious and yet at the same time I think that the themes in the Neverending Story are so important in the sense that what he was really saying was that somehow we need to create a culture whereby we preserve the child in us and whereby we preserve our imagination and our sense of wonder and that we don't give in to apathy, which is something that is so challenging as an adult with the weight of the world and gravity pulling down at us. And so I have to say I was really inspired by that kind of approach to art, that somehow the whimsical and the magical um, and, and, and fictitious things in some ways, because of their distance from reality, can can show us reality and also show us more hope and a slightly um, slightly more imaginative solutions, <laughs> which sometimes, if we get too close to reality, can elude us. I totally agree with that. One of my favorite things about the Neverending Story is the fact that you have a character in the quote unquote real world interacting with the fantasy world and he becomes so important to the fantasy world that he himself can save it. And um, that's not only as a kid looking at that as it's exciting um, because you feel as a kid, you're like, oh, this is so cool. I get to be part of the fantasy. But even as an adult, I went back and I um, watched the movie recently in preparation for this interview. And I still feel that sense of excitement with with getting to interact with the fantasy world, which I, I think that's what art does for us in general. Totally. And it's a it's a two way street because he saves the world of fantasy, but the world of fantasy also saves him. And I think, you know, that's that's something that is a message. I think the reason the never ending story stays potent is that on some level, I think our imagination is the key to our saving ourselves from being stuck, from, from not knowing which road to take, and that really we all carry inside of us this incredibly potent tool called the imagination to uncover new vistas, find our way out of trouble, you know, build something fresh. That's true. Um, so as a dancer and a choreographer, you, for your dance, have to come up with the themes. Um, what was probably one of the most recent themes that you really enjoyed that you used in your dance? Uh, well, I, st I created a piece recently called um, Around the Bend, which I'm going to be setting again in New York on the Marymount Manhattan students in the fall. So I'm excited to revisit that work. Um, and it's with dance, <laughs> I think everyone approaches it differently, but I tend to not really know right away what the work is about. The movement comes out and it's more a uh, kind of a, a strange practice of listening to the piece and waiting for it to kind of tell me what it wants to be about. And sometimes that requires a lot of patience. But I think um, Around the Bend was really about being in the middle of things. And I realized, you know, 
kind of in the middle of making it, (laughs) (laughs) that I was in the middle of my life. And I started to think about this question of the midpoint and all the associations people have with the middle. Mm -hmm. And to me, a lot of them seemed negative. That's Um, so true. Yeah. You know, we're sort of obsessed with the beginning and we're kind of fascinated with the end, but we kind of want to just get through the middle. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have all these associations with a midlife crisis and um, mid, you know, middle of the road and there's sort of, and so I wanted to revisit this notion of the middle and reinvigorate it for myself as this um, opportunity to um, keep learning and keep growing and keep taking risks. And I think as we age, we so often start to shy away because experience has taught us that we can get burned and then of course we don't um, we don't you know find the nectar that that's waiting around the corner and so it was really kind of an investigation of that that um, moment in one's life of like shutting down versus continuing to open up um, and so it's a very interactive piece and we give the audience wine everybody gets oh, wine in the audience that's wonderful and we sort of tell the audience, imagine that this moment was the exact midpoint of your life. Cheers! <laughs> sort of a strange challenge to kind of um, decide to, to really do whatever you need to do with what's left, however much time that is. Um, I love that. I love that you're inviting people to enjoy the middle and enjoy the process of life. Yeah. Yeah, so it kind of makes fun of it, and it's got a lot of humor, and it's also got depth. My parents are really old, and they're getting to the ends of their life. So I think I'm thinking a lot about, um, you know, what what is how how do you how do you how do you embody the middle as fully as you can? Um, so when when you're when you're exploring these pieces, um, I know you um, are also into music, and that you have an album coming out. Do you pick the music first or does the music come kind of organically with movement that you're creating? It comes in all different ways. I have uh, have a board member for my company who's always sending me wonderful music and sometimes I'll, you know, hear a piece that he sent and I'll, I'll have to run to the studio and dance to it, just have to move to it. But Traditionally, I'll work with a sound designer who has also a a large musical breadth, and they'll watch the material as it's forming and suggest a a variety of different sounds or soundscapes or pieces of music to it, and together we'll collaborate to find the right soundscape. And sometimes, you know, I I have one collaborator in particular, Jane Shaw, that I work with a lot. She'll suggest something once she understands the the kind of flavor of the world, and Mm -hmm. then she'll build compose music for other sections. So um, I have to say, I, I'm very not formulaic. You're not going to get a lot of formula answers. I'm going to say, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, that I think that's great. It's very exciting. I think that's great. Um, so when is your album coming out? So we, um, we, we're building this show called uh, Beanstalk Jack, uh-huh. and um, we released the album uh, a couple months ago um, at, in Williamsburg at a place called National Sawdust, um, and that was sort of stage one of building the piece. Mm-hmm. And then since then, we've had a couple more shows in Brooklyn where we added uh, some puppetry, and we are slated to do several months of performances in uh, Brooklyn. Um, and um, we're talking right now uh, to Terrytown, which is possibly uh, something that we'll be able to uh, kind of culminate all of this in um, for a show in the in the spring. So it's I, I wouldn't say it's like a wham bam release. Like we're mm-hmm. sort of trying to um, we wanted this to be a, a real concert show. So in some ways, the the puppetry differs rather than being a theatrical show where um, the puppets are kind of telling the story, the story is really told through the music and the puppets are there to give additional um, visual excitement to it, but they also sort of watch the musical instruments and watch the people playing and kind of look wide-eyed at the audience at how fast the guitarist's fingers are plucking. (laughs) And so we're kind of redirecting puppetry and focusing it back in on the music in addition to kind of adding a theatrical flavor. 
That's fun too because it sounds like you're really humanizing the puppets and making them a part of you guys and they get to enjoy the experience as well. I mean, it's it's for family audiences and I just love the way kids interact with puppets. They yes. just believe it. They believe it. It's you know, so it's true. so beautiful and it's that place, it's that place where the material and the imagination meet and the line between the two disappears. Yes. And I just think that's magic and I love watching their faces. <laughs> It's so true. If I was, I mean, I'm sure I would love this as an adult, obviously, because I still love puppets. But um, as a kid, I love the Muppets. So, so having something where you can really like watch a puppet and feel like it's real. I, I love that. Um, do you prefer, do you have a preference to being a creator or a dancer or an actress or does it all kind of commingle? No, I mean, I would say that in different periods of my life, I focused more heavily on on one medium than another. Um, and, you know, but I would also say that throughout my career, I was always blending mediums and working in an interdisciplinary approach and attracted to projects that that wanted participants that were interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, as a, as a, as a very young person, um, I was more invested in theater, I would say. Um, and then after the never ending story, I got a little bit overwhelmed by celebrity. I, I wasn't, I wanted to make art, but I wasn't sure that I was really cut out for celebrity. There were, um, it was a bit overwhelming for me at the time as an 11 year old kid. Mm -hmm. And so then I kind of focused myself more heavily on dance. And certainly as a young dancer in New York, I just wanted to push my edges and see it, how, how mean I could be to my body, how many <laughs> turns I could squeeze out of myself and how high my leg would go and all of that <laughs> kind of <laughs> unique dancer kind of torture. Yes, all that body exploration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just want to move. Um, but now in my mid, you know, 40s, um, the direct the the choreographer's chair is looking really nice. <laughs> just like all my herniated discs are like that chair looks lovely, and um and and as I sit in that chair, I can't help it. More and more theater is 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 creeping into the work, and more and more music is creeping into the work. And I'm doing a project in Prague next fall, which involves a lot of um, singing. In that I'm working with a Czech artist. There's a um, wonderful light and sound installation he created where when you sing into it live, um, the notes are thereby organized on stage into like a scale. Ooh. And, and um, there's a projector and we put smoke on the light and when you touch the light beam, it produces a note. Oh, that's so cool. It kind of is. Yeah, so that's really you cool. Dance, you're dancing through this these light beams and as you're dancing you're creating the music which he then can add layers to and add accompaniment to um, and so you're going back and then sometimes I'm singing and he goes in the machine and he uses all of his composer sp skills and he's playing it but he obviously has to play it in a much more physical way it's not his mm -hmm. fingers it's his whole body because he's reaching for these different light beams and so in that way, it kind of erases the boundary between who's the, the dancer and who's the musician yeah. because you're kind of straddling both at different times. And so that's a kind of example of how, I don't know, I, I more and more interdisciplinary um, stuff keeps happening in the, the new work I'm making. So, and yeah, and I did two plays last year, so theater is definitely calling me back. And you, you're never too old to be a character, which is what is so wonderful about acting you know so um so yeah i think that at different times depending on the stage of life you know the different right. elements called right um so that that interactive production that one's only in Prague, right are you are yeah, you yeah we're gonna to make US? um we're actually gonna make a film uh oh, nice. so that'll be that'll be available in the u.s too oh that's great because that sounds super exciting and then i was sad when it was only in Prague. <laughs> we um, did it in, yeah we did it in new york and in Prague last year and we're gonna develop it further into a film so that's great. So do you have, um, before we go, do you have any other upcoming projects that you want to talk about? 
Well, I would just say that if anyone wants to come check out what uh, Paper Canoe Company is doing, um, come to the Paper Canoe website and I'll have the uh, Beanstalk Jack shows that I'm currently booking for the fall and the spring up there. And our shows are really interactive. We come out in the audience. We talk to kids. Um, we always have some kind of craft activity for them to do because one of our missions is, is not to have people uh, just come and, 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 and watch what we're doing, but to kind of ignite their own creativity and, and, and participate in that creative process themselves. So uh, bring your kids, and, um, and it's, it's always a good time. Great. Thank you so much, Tammy, for joining us here on AfterBuzz TV. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the interview. I appreciate it, too. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, that was, I'm sorry. I, that was my video cutting out. Bro. Well, you can catch me at 123JackieB on all platforms, and you can ta catch Tammy at NeverEndingTammy or, and um, her Paper Canoe company. If you just Google Paper Canoe, it'll come up. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.